thank you very much for uh, taking the time from your schedule. We are with Brian Carpenter, who is out in uh, Corona. No, Corning. <laughs> Corning, in, California. Yeah, Corning, California, north of Sacramento. Uh, he's at uh, Rainbow Aviation, and uh, right behind Brian, we have what's called the EMG-5, which is a electric motor glider. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, yet another electric airplane, Brian. Yeah, they're uh, starting to be on the scene on a pretty regular basis, aren't they? Um, they, they are. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, what inspired you to uh, to join the electric vehicle uh, aircraft race. You know, we are we actually are kind of experts in the industry when it comes to um, sport aviation, and. We have seen over the years the evolution through the light sport industry, and we we were involved with all the ultralight aircraft in the very early days, and we've kind of seen this progression. And when light sport came along, and the FAA relooked at how we're going to deal with all these fat ultralights that were out there, you know, when we call it a fat ultralight, we're basically talking about ultralights that didn't really meet the true definition of Part 103, which is the regulations for ultralights, and so. Um, Pretty much all of those airplanes had to, had to be readdressed in terms of their legality flying. And so what ended up happening is we put them into a category called light sport. But that pretty much eliminated the ultralight industry entirely. That was kind of the end of the ultralight uh, era because we no longer had airplanes that met the true requirements of Part 103. And so we were stuck now where all these people that used to fly with out of pilot's license and tried to do it simple, tried to do it economical, um, that all kind of went away. And we've really been struggling ever since the introduction of the light sport industry to get the cost of these airplanes down. Even though these new light sport aircraft that we spend most of our days working with now are $100,000 airplanes. And that's yeah. just out of the realm yeah. of possibility for most people. Now, one of the things that really changed our perception on this whole process was over the years we've been training literally hundreds of pilots to fly ultralight light sport type aircraft. The two-stroke engines were really the only viable power to weight ratio engine that we had out there that made these things possible to even fly in the in the category. We have a real dilemma the rules for Part 103 aircraft, the true ultralights, require that the aircraft weigh no more than 254 pounds empty weight. Wow. That, that is a wow. very, very small number. Basically, we're talking about the pilots weighing the same as the aircraft. Yeah. And when you think about yeah, it like that, that's... Yeah, just to back up a minute, so help people understand, when we start talking about ultralights, what, when I think of ultralights as sort of a, a powered uh, paraglider, isn't that sort of how they, they kind of got their start? Yeah, well, anything can fly as long as it meets the definition of Part 103, which is really when we're, what we're talking about here is we're talking about um, less than 254 pounds. The other part of the element that is really difficult is it says it must have a stall speed of less than 27.6 miles an hour. 27.6 miles an hour is a very, very low speed. Yeah. And, uh, and then we have a, a speed limitation, and then we've always had the restriction of five U.S. gallons of gasoline. We could never carry more than five U.S. gallons of gasoline. And that is an area right now that we're actually dealing with in terms of redefining how we operate in Part 103. But as a result of all of this, these lightweight aircraft, you've seen them, they look like the Quicksilver-type aircraft, the trikes, the powered parachutes, the right. all of those airplanes right. in those categories, the ones that you think of when you see you know, a powered hang glider kind of looking thing. That's what you've always thought of. Right. And this aircraft certainly right. doesn't look like that. This aircraft is a completely different, um, you know, very sleek looking, low drag, um, sexy looking airplane. It's, uh, it's kind of different from that mold that we've been used to seeing out there. So here's the dilemma. We have, we have a paradox between building an airplane that weighs less than 254 pounds and meeting the stall speed requirements of uh, the 27.6 mile an hour stall speed. It has to be less than that. Well, if you do the math, you find out that in order to build a 200, um, an airplane that will fly 27.6 miles an hour, we require a wing area that's, well, almost in the neighborhood of 150 square foot of wing area. When you have to build an aircraft with that big of a wing, 
it's virtually impossible to do it for that 254 pounds. Right, yeah. And so right, we, yeah. kind of, we kind of came across a methodology which we believe is going to solve that problem. And what we've done is we only have 105 square foot of wing area, but we incorporate some big monster fowler flaps into the wing, which increases the coefficient of lift across that section of the wing. But it also causes at the same time this tremendous pitching moment on the aircraft, which has to be overcome when we deploy the flaps, and that's normally overcome by up elevator, which is a downward force on the tail of the aircraft. Well, that downward force is actually counter intuitive to what we want. We actually want upward force on the airplane in order to be able to get the speed down. And so that loses a lot of the benefits that we gain off the Fowler flap. So what we've done is we've incorporated a twin engine thrust vectoring motors on the front of the aircraft and the motors that we're using actually offset the pitching moment and produce additional vertical thrust on the aircraft. And the software we're using right now, called ADS software, aircraft design software, actually predicts numbers down in the neighborhood of about 22 mile an hour stall speeds, which beats the requirements substantially. Yeah. So now, when you talk yeah. about when you talk about <coughs> the the thrust uh, vectoring motors that are mounted there will be mounted on the front. Do those actually? Is there some tilt motion to those motors? Or are they fixed, or how does right. that work? No, they're they're actually on pylons that rotate on the front of the ah, engine. Okay. I've got a, I've got one of the actual motors without the props and everything on it right here. I think okay. you can actually look at that. But on the back back here, and so it actually pivots to produce vertical thrust on the airplane. So the the prop will be spinning around here like that. That's actually kind of what um, these will have prop blades in these like that, and right. so they'll be spinning around, and they'll have a cooling spinner on the front of that thing and then that'll all be fared in and then on each side of the fuselage um, these motors are actually articulating in order to give us thrust vectoring capabilities so we get we get vertical thrust kind of like a helicopter and huh. it's kind of a combination of a lot of technology that's already developed out there we certainly haven't invented anything new but we've we've kind of come up on a way where we believe that um, this is going to take it over the edge to make it a successful project. Right. Now, I've seen a photograph of you on the website where you're actually lifting that airframe behind you. So you sound, it looks like you're getting close to the, uh, uh, you know, meeting the weight requirements as well. Yeah, actually, we're doing, we're doing really well on that. That's where really all the magic is. It's extremely difficult. This is meeting the weight requirements is by far the most complex part of building a Part 103 legal aircraft. And the aircraft actually can be built outside of the Part 103 category as a experimental amateur built aircraft. So that will happen also, which will allow us for more freedom of flight operating in airspace that we couldn't as an ultralight pilot. There's there's quite a few restrictions on operating an ultralight aircraft. Now. Okay, so we're just shooting. So so if I bought the aircraft from you as a as a qualified ultralight, you would basically have built the aircraft, and I come in and pay you hundred thousand dollars or whatever the number number is going to be. Um, otherwise, the other option is is that I can buy parts from you and then actually assemble the aircraft under experimental category and I don't have to be quite as concerned about about meeting the uh, the weight requirements then. Yeah, the weight requirements basically go away, although um, it wouldn't allow us for too much increase in weight simply because we've designed the aircraft structurally to be able to handle only yeah. a certain amount where we don't want to sacrifice any of that capability that we have. But right. it well, does allow us to do things yeah, I was going to ask you, on, on, on that weight, that 254-pound uh, number, when they weigh that, is that with the vehicle, with, with the aircraft uh, empty? In other words, there's not, you know, there's not fuel on board, or is that with the full tank of fuel? And how does that equate to when you're going to be putting batteries in this thing to fly it? Yeah, so that's the other part of the equation that really is in limbo right now. We actually, you're kind of the first to hear about this, but we have already sent a letter to FAA Legal in Washington, D.C., um, not so much requesting an interpretation, but uh, requesting a, um, a conference with our reading of the rules. What the rules say right now is that the empty weight of the aircraft has to be 254. And the way that we are interpreting the rules is that we actually 
believe that the batteries are not part of the empty weight of the aircraft. And that means that we can carry as many batteries as part of the useful load that we want to, which would be a, a massive change in the way that we've dealt with things. Because in the past, so much of the empty weight of the aircraft has always been the weight of the motor. And now that we're talking about electric power plants where we have extremely high power to weight ratios on the motors, that motor I was just showing you there, which um, is one of two, but that entire motor with three propeller blades, the spinner, the motor mounts, everything necessary to fly except the pylons is six and a half pounds, and that puts out 16 <laughs> horsepower. That's and so that's in, amazing. In a gas powered airplane, that's just that's unheard of. You know, we, we could never even achieve those kinds of numbers. And so, and the efficiencies are really high, that gives us all that advantage. <laughs>